I am Teresa Cromwell. I'm chair of the personal board. We're going to get started. It's right at 10 o'clock, I think. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. I would like a motion from the board to approve the minutes from our last meeting. So moved. A second, it, please. Thank you. So it's been moved that we will approve the minutes from our last meeting. Hello. <laughs> we'll get started on the agenda. And what we should have is old business but and then new business. Can I make a motion? Please. Um, I make a motion to take the uh, agenda out of order to discuss the uh, overtime policy as we have people here who probably don't want to spend the whole time listening to what our part is. So I would ask the committee if we could um, like I said, make a motion to take the agenda out of order and take that item first. I'll make that a motion. Okay. So all in favor, yes. yes. Okay. okay, so then we'll go to um, new business, uh, which is we want to have uh, public hearing on the overtime policies resolution. Um, I've got a bit of a scratchy throat today, so I'm choking, so pardon me for that. Uh, so we'll start with that. Um, is everybody here in the room going to talk today? No, I'm just teasing. And so are the public hearings. I'm just teasing. Please. The public hearing is open. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the public hearing is. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. No, that's okay. I'll we'll make sure because we're online. Yes, the public hearing is now open. So we'll start with um, going to whatever order we need to to hear what uh, comments our guests have. Is there anyone that's going first? Do we have numbers, letters. City Manager, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. You're here. Um, I don't know if you had anything you would like to say to begin oh. with, or just, yeah. Thank you. As the privilege. The, the chair. That would be maybe. great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, good morning. Thank you for uh, allowing me to join you. I will actually state that uh, in my 10 years with the city, this is the first time I've been in person with the uh, personnel board. And because of the importance of this issue, I, I felt it was important uh, to come here and visit uh, with you this morning. Um, I've had a chance to visit with uh, some of our labor representatives over the last few weeks. And um, we just really want to make sure I'm clear on what it is we are uh, setting out to do with this proposal and policy. Um, if I could take the committee back to the beginning of our annual budget process, which usually begins in uh, December or January, preceding the budget adoption in June, uh, our, our general fund budget this year was facing a $5.3 million shortfall, uh, which was about 10% uh, of the city's overall general fund budget. Um, that's really attributed to a lot of factors. Uh, revenue that's not growing as fast as our expenditures are, and then as we've all become painfully aware, uh, the uh, economic conditions with inflation, most recently announced at a 9% uh, inflationary growth rate right now. Um, the trajectory that we are on today, uh, we are forecasting that by fiscal year 26-27, which is just three years away from now, uh, we will dip below zero and have a negative fund balance for our general fund. Um, the city, of course, cannot have a negative fund balance, uh, so we would be at that point trying to figure out what operations we are no longer providing to the community in order just to have a zero-sum budget. Um, that's not a sustainable trend, nor is it, I think, the kind of community that we want to live in. Um, so we have proposed a number of changes in this year's budget. One of those is what brings us here today, which is contemplating um, how our overtime in the city is calculated. Um, the team around me here can speak to the technicalities of that a lot better than I. Uh, I prefer to kind of focus my comments more on, on the why here in the beginning part of your meeting. Um, I will say that the motivations for this are uh, in any way nefarious or intended to be punitive toward our employees. Our overtime is a very necessary and important part of our day-to-day -day operations. 
uh, particularly in those services that represent a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. Um, when an officer is responding to a home invasion or a medical emergency in the middle of the night from the fire department, uh, I don't think anybody is contemplating what overtime costs. Uh, they want to make sure somebody's there to deal with their issue. But that said, we want to make certain that we are finding the appropriate balance between um, making sure those services are provided when they are most needed, but also doing in the most fiscally responsible way for our communities. And it really is the community that is, is in the back of my mind and my motivation in making this proposal. Um, we recently received our 2020 census data, uh, and there are some very disturbing trends in there. 31% uh, of the homes in Independence have a total household income of less than $35,000. Uh, even more alarming to me, at least, is that 11% of the households in our community are below $15,000 annually in household income. Uh, our state is seeing strong economic growth and low unemployment rates, but here in Independence, we still have an unemployment rate double the state average uh, at 6.5%. Uh, and as I mentioned a moment ago, this week we found out that nationally inflation now exceeds 9% which is driving our operating expenses here at the city uh, ever higher. Um, finally, we are faced with the fact that many of the programs and services that we offer here and provide in the city uh, were sustained this year with one-time revenue, which is not a good business practice, but it was the one that was necessitated this year. That's putting their future viability in serious jeopardy. Uh, this includes things like our health department and our public transit system, uh, both of which serve a very critical and vulnerable population here in our city. Uh, both of those next year will not have the one-time revenues that support them, so we will have to find resources if we continue to, uh, to wish to provide those. Um, all of that makes no mention of all the other operational expenses that continue to see increases, things like uh, health insurance expenses, uh, employee salaries and pension contributions. Again, a very necessary and important part of any organization's business plan. Um, I will say that um, we recognize, again, that, that overtime is a very important part of uh, any city's operation. Um, any change is going to have to be very thoughtfully uh, and critically reviewed uh, before implemented. Um, Mr. Norris and uh, other representatives recently negotiated a new collective bargaining agreement with the steelworkers group. Um, that has some of the new overtime provisions negotiated into it, but that also required concessions on the part of the city, um, making changes for uh, across the board increases uh, and other important considerations uh, that made that worth that group's time. Um, all of these, again, have to be very carefully thought out because there are unintended consequences if we don't account for those needs uh, and demands and implementation, and we certainly understand and want to avoid uh, those um, uh, without setting off any of those unintended consequences. So again, um, Mr. Norris, Ms. Fargo, and Mr. Place are, are better positioned to discuss with you the technical questions uh, that you may have but I wanted to make sure I put in context what it is we seek to achieve and be very uh, thoughtful and um, critically um, contemplated outcome um, that we, we wish to see so that we don't have those unintended consequences. So I will yield back to the committee. I'm happy to answer any general questions that I can. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over uh, to you. I did have one question, uh, Mr. Walker. Um, on the resolution that was presented um, to the City Council, uh, 22, Bill Number 22757, which I apologize, I don't have the date on there for that. Um, the City Council passed the resolution, then of course that was to bring to us language to implement this policy. Um, and one of the things um, that I know when I read it that I that I had a question on, and I think um, others do as well, would be Section 3 of that, where it states, to 
the extent the city manager is unable to obtain revisions to work agreements during their term, being the term of their agreement, um, the city manager is directed to eliminate all provisions that are inconsistent with the above directory, directives from work agreements as they expire or are renegotiated. Um, I, I think maybe that gives that feeling that it's a predetermined uh, type outcome. So I didn't know if you could address that. Well, again, we definitely need um, to determine some sort of uh, appropriate balance between reforms that make certain uh, overtime is used in the um, critical and necessary situations without uh, compromising our ability to deliver those services uh, at the time, place, and manner our citizens need them. Um, but all of these will require the meet and confer uh, sessions uh, to be collectively bargained, uh, to meet with uh, those uh, representatives and uh, address those. And again, I would hold up uh, that most recently approved agreement with the steel workers as a prime example of the outcome that we're seeking to drive towards of uh, conferring, meeting, negotiating, and making certain that both interests are accounted for uh, without, again, driving toward any sort of adverse impact uh, in our ability to provide community services. Does that answer the question? Um, yes, um, um, I definitely understand the intent, uh -huh. um, and I, th I just think, um, I don't know if it's possible that, of course, this is not our governing body's decision by any means, but that 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 the city council might take up reconsideration of that resolution um, to eliminate um, that section three, basically to say, you know, leaving section two where it says, you know, you are going to negotiate these things and that type of thing. I don't, I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, I will defer to Mr. Place on this. Start that sure. He's got the expertise there. So in collective bargaining, um, each side has to obtain direction from its guiding body before they start. And I actually litigated this exact issue to the Western District Court of Appeals here in Missouri before for the city of Grandview. All I do is help cities deal with unions and then help private sector companies deal with unions. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, the, the city uh, board of aldermen had directed certain things be included in a labor agreement. The union on the, uh, in the litigation said, oh no, it's not real bargaining because you've told them where to end. What they don't understand is every single company that's ever gone to bargaining before they go, the CEO tells them where to end. Doesn't always mean they end there. That's the map they got to start, because nobody can start bargaining without a map of where you want to end. And so as the Court of Appeals said in that case, it's totally fine for the board to pass an ordinance before bargaining starts that says here's where we want to end. Because the board can change their mind if, if, if the bargaining gets bogged down and their, their bargaining reps come back to them and say, hey, we've achieved 80% of what you wanted, the union's really hung up on this thing, we're stuck. Well, at that point, just like in the private sector, they could say, well, we're just not going to reach an agreement or an impasse. But they could also say, wow, that's really important, that matters. Maybe there's another way to skin that, you know, I don't I under, I understand. watch my I understand. No, you're fine. I understand. Maybe there's another way to achieve these goals. Let's find something else, and so they can change. And so as the court said, this is not a violation of the constitutional approach to collective bargaining. It's not a problem. And in fact, this is actually how bargaining works everywhere all the time. You always have a directive before you go to the table on the management side from the top that says here's where you end. And the only difference in putting it in an ordinance is everyone can see what the directive was. Now, generally when I bargain, I put the directive out there at the start anyway because I want the other side to see and we like to play with an open hand. Mm -hmm. So um, as a matter of law, there's nothing wrong with this ordinance. And as a matter of practicality, this really is how bargaining works all the time. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with Section 3. Um, I've got case law to back that up, and it is just a practical reality. You get a directive, and then you go bargain. Correct, and I, and I would and I would agree with that. Um, again, no implication that there's any type of law broken by this at all. That's not not my question. I just know. Um, I think it's um, would just give some comfort to employees to say. Yes, we are going to do this um, because a directive to the city manager from you know the city council is pretty much. Well, that, I mean, you know. here's here's the problem, and and um, the city has been giving away money 
a lot of money, millions of dollars, and they need to give away less money. And it's you always know what time you're referring to. It, excuse me. Giving away money. In oh, so, so for example, the law says if you work more than 40 hours, that's overtime. I, so overtime is a overtime. type of premium pay that's for working too many hours. This city has had a practice which is not required by law and most cities don't do of saying, for example, if you've got a Sunday through Thursday work schedule and you're sick the whole time and you take sick pay the whole time, you come in on Friday when you're better and you work, at this city, historically, that's been paid as overtime. That um, is extremely generous and I think it's wonderful if the city has the funds for it to do it, because it's very generous to the workers. But it's not required by law. And the concept of overtime is we need to pay you extra because we've worked you so many hours. When somebody's worked literally zero hours, you're coming in and paying them overtime in their first hour. That is just a pure giveaway. Now, if I'm a worker here, I want you to keep giving it away. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resist because I want to get that money, it's great for my family. I work for my family. I want as much pay as I can get. The problem is the city has been so generous with its overtime policy that it's paying far more than almost any other city in the area does. And it's paying overtime on types of work that other cities don't pay overtime on and that the law doesn't require you to pay overtime on. And so that's what needs to be addressed. Now, the nice thing for all the folks in here who are with the bargaining units Whatever you do is not going to impact them because all their labor agreements control their overtime. And those have to be bargained. So the reality is what the personnel board does today will affect the hourly employees who are not represented. For the represented folks, we're going to be talking to their um, bargaining representatives whenever their contracts come up or earlier if it's mutually agreeable. And we'll figure things out. And there are also other types of premium pay other than just overtime. And so, like with the steel workers, there are some types of things. So, like for example, emergency call out. We separately agreed that's going to be paid time and a half. Even we're not going to call it overtime because it's not overtime. But it, it well, it might be, but it might not be. It might be, but it's going to be paid at a premium pay because it's an emergency call in the middle of the night. You got to go fix a water leak or whatever it was that the sure. city would have to do. Anyway, um, probably said too much, but that's the sort of the concept of what's going on here. The city has an economic crisis. It's been far more generous than other cities in the area and than the law requires. And it's always hard to tighten your belt. So you need a pretty firm guidance from city council or it's just never going to happen. So, but that's the thinking anyway. Thank you. Anybody else? Bob? Yeah, just, just a comment. I, I just. You know, I, I listen to the fact that the general fund is going to be so short on money. And it just seems to me that the city has to do something to generate income, to pay. The, we want the police department to be the highest paid, the fire department to be the highest paid, utility people. And you're not going to manufacture money. I don't think there's a printing press anywhere here. So you got to use the money in a, in a reasonable way. And just because the city has done a very poor job in the administration over these years, I don't think you just have to continue the same approach that, that, that you're currently doing. And I've worked for a number of cities and hospitals. Nobody has a policy like this. I don't know of any place. I work for a municipality. They included holidays in it. I work for a medical center here. We included holidays in the overtime, but not vacation and sick leave and all this other nonsense. Uh, employees ought to say, hey, listen, we've done pretty good. Uh, now we've got to ensure that we're going to keep our jobs, that we're going to be able to afford these 38 new police officers and to keep the people at the top rate of the municipality for the police as well as the fire. And we've got to spend our money more wisely. And I guess that's my approach, just as an unpaid community volunteer. Uh, we don't get a pay. We don't get a paycheck for this this work. We're just volunteers. And so that's my approach. Or that's my thought on it, based upon a lot of years of experience in municipal government and hospital man and management. So I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Okay. Nope, it's said it all. Okay, okay. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Do you ask members? Do you yes, yeah. Do have a microphone for anyone who wants to speak? Yeah, we're going into this open session now. We haven't done a speaker. Pick up the microphone. I don't know. He's in charge of the microphone. Use the mic if you can. Use the mic if I can. All right. Does it come out of this? Yeah, my it? Just go sit next to her. It's like Harry. What's that? I'll just stand up here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Manager, Assistant City Manager, City Staff, Policy Board. Thanks for letting me speak today. My name is Chris Fairbank. I am the president of IFF Local 781. I represent the professional firefighters here in Independence. Um, I'm here today to speak about this resolution and, and regarding FLSA language. It's been proposed by the city administrators that these changes are necessary to reduce um, constraints caused by overtime hiring. Members of 781, however, feel that uh, these, they should be excluded from these, um, excuse me, I'll, I'll try where we're going, should be excluded based on the necessary operation that the city emergency response provides to the city. Our country is coming off an unprecedented pandemic in which its first responders served with integrity. During these past three years, we have seen significant increase in overtime costs, which should be expected. The city's essential services that include fire, police, IPL, serve a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365 days a year function. Many times these are spent on holidays away from families, um, coming in as overtime hours to protect our citizens. Unfortunately, overtime is a fundamental uh, necessity in keeping these departments serving the citizens of independence. Throughout the course of their duties, many of these members came into contact, or contact with COVID positive patients and co-workers. Many of our firefighters were forced to use their own sick leave following an exposure to COVID positive patient and co-worker. Many times these firefighters would be asymptomatic, able to report to work, never test positive, however forced to use their own accrued sick leave before coming back to work therefore create an overtime position to be filled and maintained by adequate staffing of apparatus. Subsequently, many employees in the city were afforded the opportunity to work from home, limiting their contact and not being forced to use their own sick leave. Unfortunately, we can't work from home. We've got to report to our fire stations. Our police officers have to report to, to headquarters, get in their patrol cars, and respond to emergencies. Staffing of essential services is another issue which leads to overtime. Currently, the fire department is understaffed based on the current table of organization. Throughout the support of the citizens and the passing of the fire protection sales tax, we have been given the opportunity to bring our staffing up to full. Staffing apparatus fully will help reduce the amount of overtime necessary to provide the level of response to the citizens we deserve, or they deserve. Additionally, our department is getting much younger. Currently, with we have 10 new firefighters that are gonna be released onto the field, and four more will come on in July. As we increase those numbers, 60% of our department is going to be less than 10 years of experience. These people are going to be here for a long time. Filling those spots is going to reduce the amount of the overtime that's going to be needed to carry on the functions of this city. With this policy in place, there's a sense of it's a punishment for our members to use their accrued time when it comes in terms to, to serving the citizens. Our members, I, I think I can speak with our brothers as, uh, of, of IFD, or excuse me, IPD, that our job in this city, it takes a lot out of us. Last year we ran 26,000 alarms in this city. If you go to our neighboring city of Lee Summit, 13,000 alarms. We're doing twice the amount of work that they're doing with the same amount of people. And some days you need a day off, you need a break to come in and do this job. This seems like it's an attack on our benefit. I know overtime is not a benefit. It's not a guarantee. But when our members are, are forced to either use their crew time and then potentially not pick up overtime day to help pay for their family, we're, our benefits are steadily drifting away. It is within reason that a slowdown in COVID infection rates and the ability to begin staffing the department to a level that has long been needed will reduce the overtime, overtime costs without having impact on current policies negotiated in contract language. We ask this committee to thoroughly review the information within the resolution and decide whether this course is actually truly necessary at this time. Thank you for your time.
Chris. Yes. I just have a question. Sure. I didn't quite understand. Uh, when you talked about if somebody gets COVID and they have to be hospitalized or they have to stay home uh, be because of the requirements, whatever it is, now five days or 10 days, sure. I, don't, I don't know. Aren't you able to get sick leave for that? No. So at the beginning of COVID, there was presumption. So we fell under a state of, of emergency presumption where if a firefighter, first responder, whether it be police, fire, EMS, if we contracted COVID, we would we'd be presumed that we, we got on the course of duty and that would be covered under work off. Okay. That, res, that was rescinded, uh, I believe it was July 29th of 21. So I might be wrong. Um, at that point, um, if a member became sick and was asymptomatic, able to report to work, test negative, until they could get a negative test, they would be forced to use their own sick leave, sick leave before returning to work. Um, unfortunately, when we when we come to do our job, we respond to patients that are COVID positive. And unfortunately, we live in a station with other individuals for 24 hours a day. We're going to come in contact with people. That's the nature of doing our job. When a member is forced to use their own sick leave, when they're asymptomatic, when they are negative, or until they're test negative, they're forcing me to use my crew leave. That, and doing that creates an overtime opportunity that doesn't need to be there. Now, the fire department, reaching out to other entities, um, talking with Lee Summit and CJC, we concluded that they had their own COVID testing machine. They had this from the start to the end of it. It's something that their, their employees were allowed to use, so to prevent them from, from having to use sick leave, getting the negative test so they can report back to work. We asked the city to look into that. They purchased that back in March. So we're a little bit behind the eight ball with that one. But now that's an opportunity so we can get that test done and get back to work. But during that course of time, there was a lot of overtime when guys could have been working, but they were sent home to use on something. But if they've been proven to be Once COVID, they were proven to be will negative, they be reimbursed? Once they were negative, they could report back to work. And not charged to their sick leave? And no, will that be we back have guys that, no, we have sick leave that was not reimbursed. That doesn't seem right. That's a documented experience. It doesn't seem right to me, but is the same thing applicable? I, I think that we had a case having to do with an HIV exposure up on 39th Street. I believe that was a case presented. Is that I don't know about that case, so I can't speak. Yeah, I, I we never did hear well how that came out. But what if you had an HIV exposure? I would on be covered a, under work off. It would be covered. Would a smoke inhalation, would that be covered under work off? I would hope so. Yeah, if I, yeah. If I was, I mean, if I was on a structure fire and I had smoke in inhalation, I would be treated. Yeah. Would that be covered under your retirement system? I mean, if you had long-term emphysema? I, yes, sir. Let's get to the point. Let's talk about. I mean, I, I don't want to get off subject here. We well, no, I mean, but that's that's a completely different deal. There's a higher rate of cancer in firefighters. That's a nationwide statistic. Statistic. That's getting off track of, of where where this conversation goes. Um, but that's an uphill battle. If I can try cancer, it's up to me to prove that I got another job doing what I do before I'm going to receive any benefit. But that, again, that's that's a different topic for different. Okay. Day. Gotcha. That's all. And if. Um, Chris, if someone, again, had an exposure, asymptomatic, test positive, you know, that time frame, and they're having to use that, uh, using your own you're on, using your own sick leave. Even if it's what, a documented exposure. And so once that runs out for someone who probably would be a newer person, you know, usually you've accrued more, you know, time as you've you know, been through the service. So then once that runs out, um, then from the city's perspective, nothing is paid to them. Is that correct? You're out of sick leave, so you don't get paid. And then I know that well, you have we, other... there was a policy in place that if you went negative on sick leave, it wouldn't, you would not be penalized. Okay. But there was also a policy within the city, if I reported to work and I was symptomatic, I could be... Disciplined. Disciplined for that. I think it's dangerous to talk about an overtime practice based on a global pandemic that hopefully doesn't occur for another hundred years. We established we established rules during the pandemic. Uh, some worked, some didn't. I mean, it was a new experience for for all of us. 
it was a special circumstance and if something like that were to occur again we would certainly need to look at changing our policies and when we allowed new employees and other employees to go negative on their sick leave balance we did a lot of different things we learned a lot from that um, and you know if something like that were to happen again we would certainly have to look at you know temporary temporary measures to account for that unique circumstance so I think we're, we're getting a little off track about uh, COVID and a pandemic and overtime rules when that was a unique circumstance and you know overall we need to talk about the policy and if I can speak to that uh, to one second uh, my question to that is is, uh, could, is comparing the overtime for the past three years to previous years so are we are we coming off a, a an extraordinary rate of overtime over the past three years because of pandemic and that's what's playing into the numbers that we're seeing right now and, and that's what that's that's what I wanted to say because I I know in the resolution it states that the City Council saw that it was 5.9 million dollars of overtime during the calendar year of 2021 um, so um, uh, I, you know, I don't have backup for those numbers, so I can't, I can't, you know, I just have to take those numbers as they are. I haven't asked for any backup, but yes, I mean, I, potentially assuming COVID um, stays, you know, down under the radar, I think we should, we should have some reduction in that 5.9 million just because of the fact that, knock, knock, we're moving out of COVID. So I think that I'm is part that, of that. I'm sorry, that's what I, I said but, in here. I'm, I'm yeah. hopeful and I'm optimistic that if we're trailing off of COVID, and the upping of our numbers and our staffing, that's going to reduce the amount of overtime that's necessary for our department. But in the end, overtime is an essential function for police, fire, IPL. These are essential services that are our citizens depend on. Our guys come to, to the fire station, they answer the call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There's somebody that's always ready to respond to your house and your medical emergency when it's on fire, police issue. We have, we have a great public safety department here at Independence. Let's not punish the individuals that do that job and sacrifice so much. Chris, one quick question, and I'll, uh, it's, it's sort of COVID related, so maybe I'm out of. Um, what's a percentage in the fire department that are vaccinated and boosted? I don't, I don't have that number. I don't have, I'd say 75%, but I, I don't speak. That would be for our EMS division. Would, would it be? And about a year ago, I proposed we do a, a COVID shot bonus for city employees. Would that help getting more people vaccinated if they get a nice little check down the line? That, that's, would, I think that's a topic for another day. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but I mean, yeah. you, you know, we want to we want to get more people right. vaccinated. Right. To eliminate some of the sick leave, and and you know. It, directly impacts on overtime. Sure. And, so, my, and let me let me let me again say that I don't disagree with we we have members that contract the sick leave when they're off duty. I, I'm in full I'm in full belief if you contract the sick or you contract the COVID when you're off duty, then that's that's your sick time. That is your time. Our issue is is when we had members that were contracted COVID in the course of their work with a documented exposure or a documented exposure to a coworker and then have to use their own sick leave. That creates an overtime issue that came from the department. And, and, and Chris, just back to some numbers that you have, you put out that you guys had 26,000 alarms, if, if, you know, if I'm about right, hopefully. Last year, yeah, approximately. Yeah, 26,000 for Independence and 13,000 for Lee Summit. Um, and I believe Lee Summit, correct me if I'm wrong, is Lee Summit the one municipality that is doing what we are currently doing? That's correct. Okay. Um, so does that create, um, does that create an issue with being competitive for well, employees to come made, here? And, and I fully support our, our brothers and sisters in blue here that, you know, that they're paid really well. I can tell you we're not, we're not as competitive as other agencies here. In our local municipalities for, for fire, you know, that changes on a year-to-year -year basis, and, and there's been some big increases in contracts over the past couple of years in trying to get good qualified people to come in. Um, this department, I'm, I'm proud of our department, and we have a lot of people that come in from out outside that come into our department to work. They use other departments as a stepping stone to come to us. I'm afraid that we're going to get to a point where they're using independence as a stepping stone to go somewhere else. I mean, I can go to, I, I speaking to our brothers and sisters here in uh, IPD, um, you know, you can go over across the pond to Lee Summit, you got Healthcare for Life, they got L6, 
and they run a third of the calls that these guys do on a daily basis. These guys come to work and do the patrol car, they don't get out of it for 8, 10, 12 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Morning. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Uh, my name is Michelle Sunstead. I'm the secretary of FOP Lodge One. Um, President Peterson wishes he could be here, but he is at uh, training for a week, so he wasn't able to. So you're stuck with me today. <laughs> Um, the leadership of the Lodge, along with the membership, have been given the opportunity to review the proposed language for the City of Independence Overtime Policy Amendment. Through the course of the last couple of weeks, we've been able to examine the proposal for the potential effects not only to the Lodge membership, but also the City of Independence as a whole. Over the last two years, the Lodge and the Police Department have worked diligently alongside City staff to positively affect recruiting new officers, retaining our current amazing personnel, things such as amended the amendment to Prop P and most of our most recent contract negotiations are just two of the things that have made impact on these efforts. We as a lodge recognize that change is necessary and have worked side by side with Chief Dustman to enact a policy prohibiting excessive hours worked and overtime work while on accrued leave time. The police department policy has been in place since March 9th, which means we haven't really had time to evaluate what that policy has done regarding overtime. Again, we worked alongside with him, which with this proposal, there has been no communication with the Lodge, and as far as I know, with city, with the department directors to see how any of this would negatively impact operations for any department within the city. I know that for 100% certain for the department. By accepting this current proposal as written, members will be required to work 171 hours and 28 days prior to earning their overtime rate. We're scheduled for 80 hours every two weeks, which, accrue, which accumulates to 160 hours, even I can do that math, in a 28-day period, which makes us work 11 extra hours during that 28-day period at straight time without being able to accrue overtime at that point. While we understand this is in line with the Fair Labor Standards Act, 207K exception for public safety, this will certainly have a detrimental effect on recruiting and retention. Surrounding agencies, such as the Summit, which is the one we are always compared to, may follow a modified version of this language, but they may also work a different schedule, far different from our 80 hours for every two weeks. Um, Lee Summit's our closest competitor geographically and with respect to the size of the department. They follow the same overtime circulation as what we do here at Independence. So, just as Chris Fairbank just said, if you had the opportunity to go over to Lee Summit, accrue overtime, work a third of the amount of calls, and make pretty close to the same pay, it's kind of a no-brainer as to where you would go. The proposal set forth for this committee's review states that the City of Independence paid $5,917,806 in overtime funding during the 2021 calendar year, not fiscal year, calendar year. It also states that these changes will reduce, reduce current and future costs along with increased efficiency. The police department's overtime expenditure during the time frame was $2,885,642, according to their stats. Of that amount, at least $850,000 of that, and that's just a very, very, very conservative number, was reimbursed funding. And when I say reimbursed funding, that is funding that is reimbursed by whether it's federal grants, uh, my unit, for example, all of our overtime, for the most part, is funded by the U.S. Marshal's Office. Um, ATF, we have grants with them. We have grants with the state for traffic grants. Um, none of these funds came out of the city's general fund. They are all 100% reimbursed. Hope House, and there's a lot of different ones that aren't taken into consideration in that $850,000. 2021 was an extraordinary year in that not only was the police department facing an all-time low in staffing, but we also fought through an epidemic causing further shortages which forced members to work a substantial amount of overtime. We also recognize that corrective measures need to be taken to strengthen oversight of the usage of our, our specific overtime hours. 
This was accomplished by the earlier mentioned collaboration between the FOP and Chief Dustman. According to bill or resolution number 22757, estimated savings to the city that would be realized, this proposal would be would save $153,992.42. As the overtime examples given do not differentiate between general fund, general fund and reimbursable funding, it is difficult to establish actual savings to the general fund based upon the proposed changes. According to the current FOP work agreement, which was ratified with the City Council and took effect July 1st, 2021, Article 20, Section 1, and this is a quote, Bargaining unit members who are placed on standby by the department will receive two hours, pay, two hours pay per day at the rate of one half, one and one half times their hourly rate of pay. Through the mutual agreement between the FOP and the department for the last probably 15 to 20 years, okay, I'm not saying the last year or two years, nobody has claimed that standby time, which is basically call out time. This has been a large cost saving for the department and the city for the last close to two decades. Implementation of this proposal would require, at the time of the implementation, at least, okay, these are very, very, very conservative numbers, 15 employees on standby every day of the year, 365 days, to sit at home and wait for that call out. This would be an annual accrual to the general fund of a very minimum $555,274.50. This is very conservative as when I figured the numbers, I did them myself. That is based on a 12-year officer's pay. I, there's probably very few people in this room that are 12-year officers from the PD, which means we make their, that number is very, very low from what it could be. These are personnel that we would be required to respond to any critical incidents such as homicides, robberies, barricaded subjects, serious injury, and fatal crashes, and any other thing that we may possibly be called out on. The projected citywide savings of 153,992.42 is well below the additional cost of just the police department's standby pay for that year. Also during the last two years, the police department has experienced several traumatic events where mental, mental professionals that have been paid for by the City of Independence have suggested that we take our taking, using our vacation leave and taking some mental health time due to these traumatic incidents. We all, I mean, both us and fire have been through a lot of trauma over the last several years, whether it's a loss of an officer, whether it's, you know, just the high stress calls that we go on. Any mental health professional will tell you you have to have mental health time. But that also comes out of our vacation time. Um, also on September 30th, we talked about this a minute ago. Also on September 30th, the city issued uh, administrative policy 20-01 requiring employees to take sick leave if they are experiencing two or more symptoms of COVID-19 or they will face discipline up to and including discharge. I have allergies. Anybody who has allergies can tell you if you have out if it, during allergy season you are going to have two or more symptoms of COVID. The proposed change in overtime calculations could have a chilling effect on personnel and the appropriate use of leave time. Many police department functions are staffed by voluntary overtime. These include such notable events such as the Independence Day celebration, which we just had, the Halloween parade, and the largest obviously being Santa Caligon. It's already extremely difficult to safely staff these events during staffing shortages. Should this overtime proposal become policy, it will be even more difficult to fill those spots. With respect to reimbursed overtime, these activities include federal fugitive apprehension efforts, illegal weapon enforcement, DWI and traffic enforcement, and drug enforcement efforts. Personnel may limit participation in these endeavors that greatly improve public safety and curb criminal activity if overtime is negatively affected by this proposal. Reduction in traffic enforcement emboldens dangerous drivers and reduces general fund revenues that originate from fines and court costs. As you can see, this proposal will be detrimental to operations to not only the department, but also to the city in general. While on the surface, this proposal supports the financial sustainability goal in the City of Independence strategic plan for 2022 to 2026. However, further analysis shows, quite honestly, it will negatively undercut every aspect of that plan. In short, this proposal would make for a damaging policy for employees, city management, and most importantly, the citizens. 
the only thing we as an FOP would like to do is to be able to, to completely exclude the 207K exception in that policy to give time for the policy that we work very, very hard with, with Chief Dustman, to be able to evaluate what that policy does. And I know Chris brought it home pretty hard, but yes, and I know this is going to make you upset, Adam, but yes, COVID was huge in the last two years. And that was a very large portion of our overtime funding is we were hiring overtime almost every single shift in patrol. We have to fill those patrols, those patrol shifts. We have to. Those are the people that are out there every single solitary day handling calls for service. We have to staff our dispatch center. And they're working next to each other every single solitary day in that room answering your 911 calls. <laughs> Lori, you were at a meeting where somebody specifically brought up our dispatch and that their phone didn't get answered in 13 rings. And they're hiring, they're at minimum staffing almost every single day in there. This is going to affect recruiting and retention. This is going to affect everything because of the fact that according to this proposal, they are requiring us to work extra hours than what we are scheduled to work at base pay before we can even remotely look at working <coughs> any overtime hours. You are not going to get anybody, nobody is going to want to work voluntary overtime at that point. So that's all I've got. Michelle, can I ask you to, um, one more time? I'm sorry, I couldn't write as fast as um, listening and writing and process at the same time. Um, sorry. Um, you mentioned Mar March 9th, there was the policy that you worked with, Chief Dustman. Yes, ma'am. And can you run that by me one more time, what that policy was? Basically, what that policy says is that we are not allowed to uh, burn vacation time and during our. If we burn vacation, I'll use my schedule for an example. Today I'm on vacation. During that vaca during my day to day, during my regular scheduled hours, I cannot work any overtime hours during my regular scheduled hours. Which in the past that has been an acceptable practice, but that's with everything now, with grants, with anything. You cannot you cannot make any overtime while you're on any kind of accrued leave, which that's the, this is the first time we've ever had that policy enacted. And is there, um, be it from here or from, is there, was there a cost savings estimate put to that? Was there any type of? We haven't had a chance to evaluate what that cost savings would be. I know, I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's been a practice for years, but there's no way to track it at this point, so. Unless you can correct me on that, Chief. We don't have. So you are, but the point being that you're working on, I would say mitigation. Yeah, like, we're working on corrective measures to correct the overtime usage at the police department. To kind of s try to self-control. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. If you would, could I uh, ask J uh, Jeff Place to respond to some of the the statements about how this policy impacts uh, the employees? Real quick, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to assure the officers in the room and the firefighters in the room, whatever the personnel board does, it does not affect your overtime. Your overtime is controlled by your labor agreements. And so nothing changes until we sit down with you and we bargain over this. And just for, for USW, when we just did theirs, there are different types of premium pay, right? And so in negotiations, we can sit down and say, okay, here's an example. Should this be a premium or a straight time? And is it overtime or is it some other kind of premium? We got a bargain. And I know, I don't remember when the, I don't mean to point, that's rude. I don't remember when the fire contract is up. The police contract's not up until like 2025. So anything that happens with police overtime would have to be voluntary between the FOP and the chief and city. And you guys have made a good first step. I think there are probably some other things that we can talk about. And I suspect that you guys yeah, will be on board. Asking. 
Yeah. We're asking for communication. So nothing's going to happen. No. Well, the 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 from the city's perspective, and just and this is probably my fault. I mean, if we want to talk about whose fault it is, this is probably my fault. From the legal side, we looked at this and said, we got a problem with how the city's doing overtime. What do we need to do? Well, first, we need to get the personnel policies cleaned up. We need to get let council let, let the city council tell us what overall they want to do. Get the policies cleaned up. None of that affects any unionized personnel. That sets the backdrop so that stuff's not on the table and now we can sit and talk about the labor agreement. Okay, what should it do? So the intention was always that we got to sit with you guys. Because I understand we can't change a term and condition of employment without bargaining. That's basic labor law. And 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 it may be my fault that I said to the city, get these other things taken care of first, then go talk to your unions. If that was wrong, that's 100% me. That's not on Adam. That's not on Zach. That's on me. So I do. If I've stirred everybody up, definitely this is where the blame goes. Well, and, and I would sort of respond. We don't, we're not looking for fault or anything like that, um, or blame or anything that does nobody you know, nobody any good. Um, but when I when I do hear that, you know, to your point, that if we whatever we do today doesn't affect their contracts and what's going to happen, um, then um, part of the consideration in my mind is well, then because nothing's going to change. Let's not have this language until something changes. What you do changes how it works for the non-represented yeah. personnel. So you do need to take yeah. care of it, but it's a small subset. Yeah. But when you're going to do stuff in bargaining, you want to get your own side in order first before you go try to talk to the other side. So what you're doing is really important, and you need to do what's right, whatever that is. And it's not for me to say for the non-represented hourly employees of the city. And I, should, and I should have qualified my statement to say all this language about, um, which one thing I, I'm a little confused on because it talks about fire suppression being 28 day work period. And I think you guys are 27, but I, I could be wrong. But like, I, I understand what you're saying about your those people, um, which of course, when then when you look at the 5.9 million and the breakdown and you take out, let's just take out all of police regardless of the amount of so 2.8 power and light most of that's negotiated 1.7 out fire is not included in this so uh, that's not even part of the calculation um, so if you're taking out uh, 4.5 if I'm looking right I mean we're only talking then the bottom line being 1.4 million um, which is the but the council made the decision based on the 5.9 million so I do understand that you may need to negotiate these, and and as you said, as you stated in the resolution with the city council that says city manager or his you know representative shall negotiate these if you know as they come up, that's the directive to them to do that. But at this point, I would suggest that we eliminate in this policy the things that have anything to do with any bargaining agreement group. So you don't have special mm. work mm -hmm. I hate to say that because I'm not sure who all works special schedules I understand fire police I, I'm sorry that I don't understand all the other shifts but because that's not going to affect anything it's not it's not going to save us 5.9 million dollars next year um, because the, the union negotiations won't have started until five years from now or three years from now or whatever is if, if the language is not what we think is going to, if, if it's not important now to do it for the special work groups, I understand your 40, you know, your Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 type thing. Um, I, I think that the precedent is that, that the, what the baseline, I guess I'm wanting to say, is in the resolution that city council said that they want to direct the city manager to do it. But so I'm not sure why we need to do this language now. You, you could do the city policy, and this is provided it's okay with HR and everybody else. But the city policy could say this policy does not apply to any representative personnel for those people see their labor agreements. And then you could say whatever you want to say. That's so totally so we could potentially change that language. And then everybody in here who's represented doesn't have to worry about what happens because yeah. it's in their labor. Yeah. Okay. 
I mean, that is that sounds like a great. Yeah. That sounds like a win-win. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're not saying it can't happen. We just have to negotiate it. You're going to, and your group will negotiate when it's time to negotiate. You don't feel the pressure of anything, you know. And I think, you know, postponing it a little bit without that, you know, having that language out will give time for the March. Uh, We're also it. down 39 officers at this point to the tune of just over 1.6 million dollars, and you have to. So you figure that of that of our 2.8 million, you can just about take out a million of that based on staffing shortages, just for those 39 officers that were down. As of today, we are down 39 officers. Which again is something that which will you're eliminate some of them. To a, you know, it's correct. Another mitigating factor correct um, and I remember from the uh, <coughs> uh, the budget presentation from uh, city manager uh, first part of uh, thank you May. <laughs> I was thinking April uh, that there was also a section in there about the firefighters about how they're going to try to mitigate their overtime by and I'm not gonna be able to name off all the points but there were points in there you know you're gonna hire some new people and do some different things to help eliminate overtime so Kind of what I, you know, think that we have some opportunities to work, like you said, let's work with management to do these types of things. I know you're working, Chief is working very hard to hire people. We know that's a tough process, but we have to hope that that starts coming up. I know you guys are very focused on that. Get more officers. You put some of these things in place, That these other things that you're doing. Fire puts in some of these things. We don't end up with another huge COVID, you know, <laughs> issue. Over time, may you know, it, it, let's see if it comes down on its own, and then, um, and then negotiate when you negotiate. But that's all, that's all we're asking for is some sort of collaboration with this whole thing because there's been nothing to show what positive, what negative outcomes could happen from this. Like I said, is that that standby pay the second that that takes effect, that you're you're looking at the standby pay also taking. Where was the standby pay that you quoted? I just it's in the contract. I even quoted the section. Do you remember? I was just asking what section that was. Could, could you show the microphone, please, so that people can? Sorry. No, no, no. I just want to make sure that people who are listening out there can hear. Can you have this one? Article 20, section 1. Thank you. Page 31, because I actually remember that off the top of my head. <laughs> you have a lot more brain space than I do. Remember things like that. I've been looking at this for two weeks. <laughs> Okay, you have a question. Yeah, I was interested in something you said and had to do with recruitment retention and physical facilities. Uh, I really am very prejudiced about the fact that if people go to work, they ought to work in a nice place, a place which is conducive to, over t uh, to, to uh, efficiency, and I'm con very much convinced, particularly after listening to the city manager at the last city council meeting, that our facility is not that. I mean, if somebody imploded it, assuming everybody was out, of course, <laughs> uh, uh, it, you'd have a lot more efficiency and you might have some saving in overtime. Uh, can you address that? What, what, have, you, have you talked about that at all? I mean, I've been here 27 years and I'm not, I can't sit here and say that I don't think we need a new building, but this really isn't the time or the place for this discussion. <laughs> well, you brought it up. As much That's as the reason I brought it up. So, I mean, you, you talked about physical facilities and impact and overtime. So, since that was the case, I... I, I mean, I, I think it's pretty public knowledge that we, we need a new building. I mean, that that's... I said, and I believe that that's being worked on as we speak, um, so. trying to come up with the funding for that and figure out how that funding is going to, what that's going to look like. But, but, it's, again, hard, but it's, it's hard recruitment if you have a yes. new police officer come into that building and you go out to Lee Summit, uh, Lee Summit Road or whatever the street is. In, I cannot in Lee deny Summit, that. And you look <laughs> at their facilities and I guess something in, in Blue Springs. You're at a competitive disadvantage right there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the city ought to get on their horse and do something with that building. Uh, you know, so that's all. Thank you. Tracy, you got anything? Nothing? Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Good morning, board, city council members, or members. 
Chad McGregor with IBW Local 53. We represent approximately 300 employees in the city, vastly d different departments all across the city. And I didn't prepare a statement today, but I just wanted to let you know that I concur with Sister Sumstead, uh, Brother Fairbanks, and everything they said. I believe implementing these FLSA law uh, rules and laws into the policies and procedures are going to be detrimental to the recruitment and hiring of new employees all across the city. Um, just for instance, public works, uh, municipal services, street maintenance, it's a revolving door. There's constant battle and fight against their benefits and wages. They uh, have trouble keeping people, parks department, public works, independence power and light. There's 31 linemen, 15 of 31 left in a five month period this last fall due to a tax on their benefits and the low wages. Um, We've done some things to try to work on that, but this is going to make that door revolve again, and it's not going to stop unless we try to stop it. None of these employees in any of these bargaining units have caused this issue uh, with the shortfalls in the city budget. So we just hope that you will not agree with these changes. <coughs> Thank you. I guess all the union leadership is talking, so. I'm Tom Gefkin, I'm president of CWA Local 6360, and I don't have a prepared statement either. But we represent the 911 dispatchers, and they work a very hard job, 12 hours a day, lots of overtime. You never know what that call is gonna be that comes in. And as they take their week's vacation, many times they'll get called in on their day off, and now they have to decide do I want to come in or do I want to spend time with my family? So as these overtime changes take place, whether they're contractual or, or not, just understand that the employees will may change how they decide their, whether they want to be loyal and, and come in on their time off or do they want to spend time with their family? And you might find that those decisions are, have changed. Seth Robertson, I'm the president of the USW. I wasn't prepared to talk, nor was I going to, till my name was kind of muddy just a little bit. So I wanted to let you guys know, they said that we did make an agreement collectively bargaining. We do not do overtime in the water department. So this does not really affect us. The way that we came to our agreement is all of our work is emergency. We work main breaks. We don't know when that's going to happen, so it is emergency work. I just want to let the board know that with you guys making a decision that some of these other people, you know, we don't do minimum staffing. So if you're on vacation, we don't backfill positions. We only work on a strictly call-out basis. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Henry Corner, retired fire captain, Independence Fire Department. And uh, I thought this was going to be kind of boilerplate, but I'm, I got confused. And I'm not a lawyer, and I surely don't want to insult the esteemed counsel over here. But, and Section 3 does not pertain to the vote. However, Section 3, which Commissioner Dominic brought up, is pretty important because it's not like a board, a private sector corporate board given direction that they could vote later near the termination of agreement that they wanted to change. Section 3, and I could be corrected, codifies a legal mandate that the city is directed to eliminate all provisions contrary to what's here. And now it seems to me this becomes a predetermined, in inflexible position before you get to bargaining. 
So I, I don't know that, and I would ask that you don't embrace this language until you know that it's not going to, by legislation, just be shoved down the union's throat. Because this, this is not a corporate board decision or even a, a private meeting with, like a executive session with the, the council said, this is our goal and direction, as the councilor pointed out. This, this is, is, you're telling these people today, when your contracts come up, you shall, by this law, remove that. Which brings me to the next point. If I work, if I'm on vacation all week, and there's a major uh, catastrophe in this town, they're going to call me at home. And I'm going to come in with premium pay. They're going to call these police in. They're going to come in with premium pay and have a shooting at a school. Okay. Mm -hmm. this, will, this will mandate the removal of that because there's no provision here for emergency call out or for the uh, position of your, your job is to be standby. We've had that for mechanics and I think other people were if you're called out for 30 minutes or two hours, you get a minimum of two hours overtime pay. So that this is, I would ask that before you go forward, they think this out and consider the, the, the other elements and other positions. Because, yeah, you can just say, yeah, let's sham the Fair Labor Standards Act wage and hour division down our throats. This is a, this is not a mandate. This is a this is a floor. You have a right to treat them better. I don't think, uh, you know, we're generous. I don't know that the city's, in my experience, been very over generous. When if you want to eliminate overtime, you hire extra manpower to eliminate overtime. And if you have extra manpower, then your workers' comp claims seem to reduce because it's, it's if you have more people show up on a scene, you have less less injuries. So, I mean. It, this whole thing, it would be my plea that you ask them to take that back and account for the other elements that are not here and to remove a, and ask the council if they would consider in their prerogative to remove that mandate and put it as a uh, an objective or a goal. Because I think you're right on that, but I didn't think so before you guys. Please, this is not ripe in my opinion, please have them go back and bring it back towards, it, it does account for what I brought up. Thank you. So just, just to clarify on two issues, number one, um, the Court of Appeals has explained, and I thought I did it all right, but I guess I wasn't clear enough. When you adopt a labor agreement, it's a new ordinance. And so if the labor agreement bargaining led to something that's different from what was in the original directive, it amends by adopting the labor agreement, you amend the prior ordinance automatically. So the council can always change its mind. And um, I mean, you can go look at the case, it's City of Grandview uh, versus the Fraternal Order of Police. It's from 2010, Western District Court of Appeals for the state of Missouri. Um, so that's not a problem, number one. Number two, that doesn't address all those other premiums because it's a, poli it's a, it's a, it's a resolution about overtime. Emergency call-out is not overtime. It's something else. It's a different kind of premium pay. There's no reason to address emergency call-out in an overtime provision because emergency call-out is something else. Similarly, Working on a holiday is something else. It's not overtime, but it may be double time or something else. It's a different premium pay. So the point is, your example, somebody's on vacation, they come in because there's an emergency at the city, they should get a premium. They shouldn't get overtime because they haven't done any work. It's not overtime, it's a different premium. It should be an emergency call-out premium. But if that person's on vacation for the whole week and somebody else is unable to come to work and they decide on a voluntary basis to just fill a regular shift, I would posit it's crazy to call that overtime. They haven't done any work. It can't possibly be overtime. And, and that's fine. They don't have to. If they want to pick up straight time pay, they come in. If they don't want to, they don't. But the point is, 
All the other cities in, in the metro, except maybe one, all of them managed to get people to come in without having to pay that premium. Nobody else does this. And so when people say, oh my gosh, nobody will do it without this, well, like 50,000 other city employees in this metro area managed to work. So the city looked at this and said, we've got an excessive overtime payment, and they're trying to get their hands around it. The police have already started trying to find some ways to cut down on some things. And all that, no matter what this board does today, it doesn't impact any union because you're under your labor agreements. Yeah, and we're going to do that no matter what the board does, and we're going to discuss it, and we're going to bargain over it. But that is going to happen no matter what. But it's a negotiation. It's not a, it's not a conclusion. It's a negotiation. Anyway, that's um, for this board, whatever you do, it doesn't involve any of the unions. So I just want to keep that clear. Um, it may be confusing at times. That's all. I feel like you should take the language out if it doesn't apply. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Then take it out. Could, if it's not going to be used as a force for shutting down the we, um, If you want to speak, could you come to the mic? I, I just, and I'm sure Teresa, want, like, let's just keep it one person at a time because it's hard to hear with everybody. But do you, did you, I'm sorry, if you want to say something, could you say it into the mic so that the online people can hear it? I'm sorry, it's just, we just right. have to make sorry. sure that everybody knows that this is open and keep it one person at a time. So, uh, I wasn't prepared for a speech either, but I'm just going to respond to some of the things that have been said. My name is Christina Hayes, and I'm a dispatch su supervisor over 911. Um, I am not represented, so this is an effect for me today. Um, I work on the floor with all of the dispatchers. I have the same schedule. I do the, well, pretty close to the same schedule. I do the overtime. Um, so you're telling me that I have to mandate these people and tell them they have to come in to get us to minimum staffing. But if they have vacation on Saturday when they're supposed to be off, that's going to be regular pay after I've forced them into 212s and 216s. So, yeah, well, if they volunteer for two 12-hour shifts on their eight-hour days, I can force them into four 16-hour shifts. You're also telling me that I have to mandate these people if on their Friday, so let's say that their Friday is on a Thursday for the, our rotating schedule, so they get forced over on their Friday. Now that is cutting into their vacation time. They have a plane scheduled to leave as soon as their shift is over. I have now forced them over four hours. They get, uh, they have vacation time on Friday and Saturday that they're off, that they used their, their leave time. And those 16 hour shifts that I forced, that's now gonna be regular pay and I've now cut into their vacation time. Say so they were gonna have a seven day vacation. Now it's a six and a half day vacation. And you're telling me that I have to force them and then tell them, hey, you're going to get paid straight pay on top of that. Also, I'm non-represented. So that means that if we have some kind of a major incident and you want me to come in for straight pay, I have to decide, is it more important to lead these people and tell them, hey, this is the direction we want to go with this major incident? Or is it more important for me to stay home because it's going to be straight pay? I've already done my 40 hours. So a lot of the supervisors are not represented. So if you want no supervision to come in after we've already worked our 40 hours for the week and you have a critical incident and you want no supervision for that critical incident. Um, Wouldn't it be emergency call out if it was a critical incident? They're not represented. No. I'm not represented. Okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you're not talking to a mic, they can't hear you online. So let's give you this. Or Thank you, Chief. Of meetings that people can't people get frustrated. Or see, um, that creates no, so, so, so the city either has or can have its own policies for other types of work. Overtime is only one thing, and people keep seeming to conflate that or think that if you're not getting overtime, there are no other premium that could apply. All I'm saying is it makes all kinds of sense to have a policy that says. If we have an emergency, we'll do emergency call out at a premium rate of pay. And if that doesn't exist, it can exist. It just would have to be adopted. So uh, to pay somebody a premium pay when they haven't done any work doesn't make sense to me, but I'm not the policymaker. Other cities don't do it, and this city's short of funds. The city will have to decide what it wants to do. 
but when you've got an emergency and you want to get people out, it makes all kinds of sense to have an emergency call out ready to pay and you can take care of things that way. So the bottom line is you can make policies that make sense that don't just blow out time and a half every single time somebody comes in outside their regular schedule. You can target the spending so that your money is spent more wisely. And that, I think, is the overall objective. But you just said, one, you only address one half of that. And two, emergency call out. You didn't address the fact that I can mandate somebody over and cut into their vacation, and then now that's going to be straight time. Well, there should be a vacation policy that addresses that, that says if somebody's, like, in your example, they had a flight to leave town for their vacation after the end of their shift, we clearly shouldn't be able to mandate somebody to keep working when it's part of when it's after their last shift and they've scheduled a flight to go on vacation. I mean, no, no, I don't know any employer that would do that to somebody. Um, Every day. And 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 we need to find a way not to. Okay, so so with dispatch, uh, basically you said, okay, so they don't show up. That's okay. That was your response, um, and I quote. Uh, so if we don't show up and nobody answers the phone, that's okay. That's okay for your family. That's okay for everybody on this board. Uh, it's okay for us to not show up and nobody to answer your call. There, there, I, I absolutely didn't say it's, there's no, it's okay for people not to show up. What I, what I, in, in the dispatch example, it's got to be staffed. It doesn't have to be a particular person. And what I'm telling you is there are about 30 other dispatch agencies around here who managed to do that and staff and do just fine and answer their calls without having to pay overtime to somebody who hasn't done any overtime. And that's all I'm saying. I've never run a dispatch. I absolutely do not know how to run a dispatch. You know a thousand times more than I will ever know about how to run a dispatch center. But I can tell you that the rest of the metro is not doing it this way. And the city has a problem with spending too much on overtime. You're right. The rest That's of the metro doesn't do that. And have you seen the news for Kansas City? Have you seen how long their wait times are? Have you seen how they're half staffed? Have you seen the mandatory overtime that they have and how they can't get it filled either? Because if you're going to compare us to the rest of the metro, Kansas City is a great example of what's going to happen when you guys do this. And you're going to tell me that uh, I'm not going to pick up overtime anymore. So now I've got to tell these guys, hey, you're mandated, but bye. Have fun. You can work 16-hour shifts and eight-hour turnarounds four days a week, but I've already done my 40 hours, so sorry, I'm out. Well, but if you've already done your 40 hours, it all will be time and a half because then you will be on overtime. So I don't understand why you're concerned. Once you get to 40, it will be time and a half. And by the way, I, as I said, I don't know every dispatch, but I know Lenexa, Leewood, Overland Park, they answer the phone. They don't automatically pay overtime if you haven't worked more than 40 hours in the week. So, you uh, know. Could I, could I address, could I, could I please address, um, I worked as a paramedic for 12, 15 years, um, both here on, with masks on the Kansas City side and then over in Johnson County. So I was dispatched by uh, Johnson County dispatch over there. And I worked at Lenox Station, Shawnee Station, all those. Um, we, we are unique in a couple of things. One, just back to the statistic that Mr. Fairbank threw out was, you know, that we're looking at, I've got to look again, 26,000 call outs versus half of that at 13. And granted, I assume he's speaking of fire calls, so, you know, I mean, numbers, but there's going to be some relevance to that on both sides. Um, uh, it, I, I don't know. I know Lee Summit is the one that is following the plan that we currently have. I don't know what their staffing levels are in dispatch. Um, I believe I believe that we're down in dispatch trying to hire people. Would that be correct? Yeah, we're subject? down. We're down. We've lost six people, and since the beginning of this year. And how and many? We have 30 as our full staff. Okay. So that's almost a third. Okay. So so it's if we were flush with. Officers, dispatchers, firefighters, all. You know, if we were flush with staff, then you wouldn't have a mandatory call out or hold, you know, hold over or force in um, because you'd have some of those other people to call, you know, to come in. Um, so I understand your point kind of in a grand scheme, but when. Have, Knowing what I know in public safety, having worked in it, um, if 
like if at MedAct, if you have to just staff the trucks, and if you don't, if someone gets sick and can't show up, you have to come in, or otherwise you're disciplined. Actually, you know, and there's different policies. Everybody has a different policy on callbacks and that type of thing. Um, and I think, just to clarify too, you're mentioning once you work 40 hours, then it is time and a half. I believe that, um, Christina, you were referring to, I've been on vacation or I'm going to be on vacation during my work period and you're holding me over for four, eight hours on that first day of my pay period. So no, she wouldn't have worked that as overtime, but it will give, it will not give the incentive to do that. Now there's other ways to handle that, I mean, of course, but um, I think that we are a city that is understaffed, and I think lots of cities are. Lots of cities are, we know all this nationally even. So I think that part of what, when I come, you know, we come down to kind of c conclusion dis discussions and things like that is, I I'm hearing mitigation efforts I, from Michelle, from Chief Desmond you know, from fire that was presented and thing, you know, and in other ways. And I know you guys have worked, because I know the directive was to work very hard to keep your overtime under control, which you want to because you have a budget and you don't want to blow your budget. I mean, that doesn't help your department. Um, but I think at a time when we are facing issues of recruitment and retention, um, when we are bound on the south side by Lee Summit, no offense to Bayless and Lee Summit, I love it too. Uh, but you know, th they have a very different situation that can be very positive for somebody who's tried to determine whether they're going to come to work for IFD or, you know, LSFD or CJC. Um, so I think I think it's important for us to stay competitive because for one thing, we need to have staffing. And if we don't have staffing, this will only get worse. We have to hire more people. And then we have to retain the people that we have. Because you're going to have the people in the middle. You're going to have the people at the top who are like, I'm here until retirement. You're going to have those people in the middle who could see an incentive to go somewhere else. If, if they're like, well, I, I don't want to work for you know, uh, Independent Dispatch because I could get held over and that's not time and a half for, you know, that type of thing. I would just like to see that we give an opportunity, one, for some of those mitigating efforts to work and so we can have some kind of measure of that. See how we're doing with recruitment. I know we're down 39 officers. You know, I know you guys are working hard on that. Um, I also think that, um, that uh, to the point that I believe it was Michelle made, these numbers, the 5.9, um, I'm just looking at the top line number, were drawn from, I presume, W-2s is on a calendar year for 2021. And we know during most of that time, it was a little up and down, but most of that time we were, you know, staffing up for COVID. You just got to have people come in when somebody's out with COVID. Um, so I would like to see first of all is to look back at the overtime like what we've got going on now in 22 because on a calendar year basis we have half of our year plus you know and then going back to 19 and 18 I mean there's just an anomaly period in there that I don't I don't like to use statistics that are driven by please help us one pandemic in a lifetime you know, that it literally affected everybody. So I don't know that even the numbers feel uh, correct to me in in this in the in what was presented to council and with Michelle's comments about you know eight hundred and fifty thousand coming from you know uh, marshals or DEA or fugitives you know whatever all those places are. I don't know if that's taken into account, and I apologize. I have not asked to um, tie out those numbers to anything, so I can't can't say what that exactly is. Something else I wanted to touch on is your example, I think was a really poor example of saying somebody's going to call in for 40 hours of their work week and then come in and then that's going to be overtime at the end of their week. That's not the way it goes. The way it goes is we work our 40 hours and then people call out sick because they've done four 16s in a row. Um, it takes a toll on our bodies. We're exhausted. I think that uh, I think I've aged 15 years in the six years I've been here in Independence um, because I've worked. I mean, I've 
doubled my income in overtime. So I'm one of those people that gets the overtime that you're talking about. I've doubled my income, so I understand that that's cost you guys a lot of money. But I'm not filling a spot in extra. I'm not coming in and just saying like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an eighth person in the room today and you're gonna pay me time and a half for it. I'm the fourth person or the fifth person when our minimum staffing should be six, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. It's wearing on us. Um, most of us are probably on some kind of medication now for psychiatric stuff because of the stuff that this has done to us. Um, we our, our sick leave has increased, and it's because of what's been going on with how much this has taken a toll on us being down a third staff. And I did say we lost six since the beginning of the year. We were already down three, so we we're down nine spots. Nine spots out of dispatch. Um, we do have a few in training, but they don't count in the room yet. So we're picking up all of those all of those spots right now. So. You're gonna wear them down. Now we did this when I first started. I was number 11 out of 30 six years ago. So we've definitely been doing been doing a lot of efforts to try to recruit and everything. You talk about recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. Well, what about retention? You need to keep the people that are already here. And if you do this, the people that are already here are going to leave. And by putting out there and saying, "Look, Lee Summit does this, and we're not gonna do this," you just put a flyer out that said, "Go apply at Lee Summit." That's what you did. And dispatch centers are short everywhere. It will not be hard for us to find other jobs. And IPL dispatch took two of our dispatchers, took 38 years of our dispatch experience out of the room by taking two of our dispatchers and paying them $40 an hour. And then on top of that, you talk about negotiation. That's cracking me up here and you guys talk about like, hey, you know what, it's okay because we're gonna negotiate this. You're not negotiating this. I know that you're not negotiating this. And what I mean by that is you're saying, okay, if you want raises, we're gonna take this away. That's not a negotiation. That's a force it down your throat. That's a, we, if you want to raise, we're going to take this overtime thing away. That's not a negotiation. Or, hey, we're going to hold this over your heads and we're going to talk about this next year. This is what's going to happen. And if you want some of the things that you're asking for, you have to give this up. And I, I just, that's not a negotiation to me. And, and you're making it sound like you're going to negotiate, but this, this has come across as this is a final thing and you don't have a choice. And this is just fighting for my people. I'm already out, okay? And you say, like, the 40-hour thing, that you, the example that you gave, like, yeah, I've already worked my 40 hours. I'm talking about I've worked two days, 16-hour shifts, and then I have vacation at the end of the week. And then I'm like, hey, guys, you're really short. You've got three people. Bye, because I still have vacation at the end of the week, and now this will be straight time if I stay over. That vacation time, I've earned. That was one of the benefits that I signed up for. So, yes, it's taken from, you know, I might use... 40 hours of vacation, but that's my time that I earned. So you say, hey, you know what? You haven't worked your time because you haven't done 40 hours this week in the console on the floor. I earned that 40 hours, and I lose out on a lot of family time already. So your example of they call in sick for 40 hours, and then at the end of the week, they're going to work 40 more hours and get paid overtime, I've never seen that happen. In six years that I've worked here, I've never seen anybody off for 40 hours and then work 40 hours of overtime. What happens is, is that they work 60 hours in a two or three day period and then they call in sick at the end of the week. And then now you're telling me that that 60 hours that ran them down, that's gonna cost them healthcare costs, we're not even talking about their leave time, it's gonna cost them healthcare costs, that's what's going to affect us. You're like, nope, that's straight pay now. I don't care that you got sick from working 60 hours in two days. Three days, two and a half days. So that's the problem that I have. And I'm not represented, so pretty much you've already told me I'm screwed. And I don't matter, but I'm a dispatcher too. I think we've made it very clear what our goals are, what we would like to see happen. Is there, just like I said before, is there are processes in place to try and mitigate the overtime for both police and fire and sounds like all the other bargaining units. I don't know as much obviously about any of the other ones. Quite frankly, I don't care what steel workers signed. No offense, Adam. I, it just doesn't affect me. Um, but I think we've we've made it very clear what we would like to see happen. It was already on the table to strike out that language and put in there um, to go by what our bargaining units are saying. Um, I think we can keep beating this dead horse. I know bad pun, but we can keep beating this as much as we want to beat it, but it, it's still the same outcome in the long run. And like I said, when I was up here speaking before, I think that we had made that agreement um, to look at taking striking that language out 
in putting in there the bargaining unit side of it and I we just need to leave it at that instead of continuing to say the old same thing over and over again and arguing and arguing and arguing. I am personally not aware of any other agencies, Mr. Place, that are using this exact verbiage for police departments because I have checked with most of the Kansas City metropolitan area in the last two weeks I, and I'm not looking for any kind of response. Um, there are some tweet up uh, well there there are some different things to mitigate overtime that some other agencies are doing but it is definitely not that requiring people to work over and above their regular straight pay so like i said i think we've made it very clear as to what we want so okay. at least collaboration of some sort which we've gotten none of Mayor Wheeler once said on the uh, item of a unified county government, independence is too independent to be a part of that. Point being, we're not like any other city. Second thing is, it, this language does not contemplate standby, call out, order in. And it's until it does, it's not ripe. And my, and my, my plea to you, it's not ripe because it. it will later be by legal re required it will become in conflict uh, with the contracts that were passed but now you have post-contract legislation saying that you shall eliminate anything that contradicts with this so this should at least have and I don't speak to these there might be other premium pay standards but at least on, on its face, it doesn't have the premium pay for standby call in or order, uh, uh, standby call in or order in. See, so while that's not covered, and while the council has gone a direction of of making it law to shove it down the union's throats, like the one lady said, it's really not going to be bargaining. It's going to be more like a hostage situation. So please send that back, remand that back to at least deal with the premium pay situations and ask the council to put it as a goal, not as a, a legal requirement. Head of DS. I think I'll just let this sit. Okay, thank you. I, I, was, I was just thinking, it sounds like we've heard from members of the bodies that wanted to speak would that be correct we don't want to exclude anybody but if if you know if we've heard I think um, oh, good. I would make a motion to close the public hearing thank you second, no, second. great okay. no. the, okay. uh, yeah I, I don't know whether we're supposed to make a decision today but we've heard so much information from people uh, and from the attorney and the administration but I'm not really prepared to make a decision or vote on anything today. I want to stop and think about some of the things that you all have presented to us and make it try to make an intelligent decision. And at the present time, we meet once a month, usually at the utility center on the second Friday uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, we couldn't get the meeting room out there this time, so that's why we're here. Uh, Maybe the city and the attorney can take into account some of the issues that have been brought up and tweak his policy or maybe make appropriate changes or compromise, something which would be uh, something that would be helpful in trying to, as best we can, accomplish the goals of the city as well as the employees. And then lastly, please feel free anytime to come to our meetings. Uh, like I say, at the Utility Center, second Friday of the month, currently. And uh, we don't see a lot of people there. Uh, Henry's usually there and a number of other seven or eight other people. But yeah, it's open to the public. Anybody can speak. And I think that's all. Right. Okay. And I would, based on what you just said, um, I would make a motion that we table this item for uh, for the review based on you know, more information provided and a little more thought put into it. 
Well, and in the interest of time, yeah, we've had a lot of information today, <clears throat> and we thank you for that. And for me, very, very helpful. Uh, and I assume for the rest of the board. Mm -hmm. um, are you making a motion? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think we closed the public hearing. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah. I, I'm making a motion now outside the public hearing that we Thank table you. this item uh, for further discussion based on comments we've heard today and other information from management as well. That's my motion. I second. Great. Okay. We're all in favor of that. Yep. Great. Okay. May I make Thanks. one? Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's great to take the feedback and, and I think there's been, but here's the, the reality. Every day that goes by, I have less money to cut if we don't do this, which is $315,000. Um, so if the committee would be willing to let us incorporate some of these feedbacks, circulate it for comment, and then maybe schedule a special meeting, um, time is a little bit of the essence. If we're not going to do it, then we're going to need to figure out a different way to balance our budget this year. I would be yeah. yep, I would be agreeable to a special yeah, meeting. That's great. Shall we determine then? Do we need a motion for that? Yeah. Well I mean, no. set, you should set that date now. Yes. Whatever that date is, you yes. should go ahead and, and pick the date if you're gonna have a special meeting. It can't okay. be the regular meeting. I think it's like the what is it, the twelfth of He's asking August. us to do it early. To do, yeah. Earlier so than yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So let's look at calendars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So two weeks from today would be uh, July 28th. I'm available. From the attorneys, are, is a, are the legal folks going to be able to kind of work with the administration to kind of get a tweaked proposal or? Oh, it's up to you. So. Whatever they need, we'll take care of. All right. Let's meet at the utility center. July 28th. Or do you want to do the 29th? Because we're usually on a Friday. So I can't do it on the 29th. Okay. okay. I'm good. 28th, 10 o'clock. On Thursday, July 28th. Friday. No. Well, I can't do it on that Friday. Oh, you can't do it on that Friday? So, July 28th. As special as I am. July 28th. Yeah. So, I make a motion that we put on the schedule for a special meeting on July 28th, 10 a.m., presuming we can use the utility center unless otherwise that we can't we'll find another meeting spot okay that's okay um okay. that's great um i'd like to make another uh just a quick comment and then make another motion um for consideration by the board um i would ask uh as butch uh, used the word that i was looking for um because i do understand the concern of section three of Bill number 22757 that was passed, that resolution did pass with the city council re saying that, you know, directed to eliminate, you know, things as it's like it sounds like a mandate or a, a predetermined this is what's going to happen. Um, I would make a motion that we would ask the city council to re reconsider this now ordinance uh, to remove language to remove section three completely and to leave section two basically the city manager is directed to request bargaining with each of the seven units to negotiate uh, changes to overtime provisions with the above eligibility I, that still leaves the that still leaves it open for that to be done it just i think it and i understand that is not you don't understand your the case case law that you have that says it's legal but i think it, it is uncomfortable and i think that we can uh, we can get done what we want to get done, which is further discussion and figuring this out by removing that, and I think that that would give some comfort uh, to the employees to do. So that's my motion that we ask City Council to reconsider. Um, this would be this is the resolution bill number 22757. What date was that meeting? I don't know what the date of that meeting was. Um, th this was the original. This is the original. Oh. Yeah. oh. This is the original resolution that bill that came out to, that says a resolution directing the city manager to pursue immediate changes yeah. to the city's overtime policies and procedures. That was passed um, with the information provided here, including the 5.9 million that I, I think I have some questions on, um, and which then trickles into some other things. Um, 
Now, of course, we can't direct city council what to do, but I would make a motion asking them to remove section, to go back and amend the ordinance to remove section three. I'm not, I, don't, I didn't hear a second, but I, I'm wondering if that impacts the city managers, what she said. Yes, it does. Okay, please. Yes. Yes, I mean, we can, we can, if the board decides to put that on the agenda, that's fine, but it won't be supported by staff. That's, that's fine if you want to do that. Okay, because, yeah, because we, yeah, we advise to the city council, so, yeah. So, so, I, I don't know, is there a second on that? Is there? And are we comfortable with what I'm talking about? Yeah. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. All in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. No. Okay. I didn't hear a second. Uh, yeah, and I shouldn't be. Yeah, but I yeah, should I, leave I, to her to do that. Else. She should be call, yeah. <laughs> calling that. But. Yeah. Well, I, I. Yeah. Okay. We need to have the support of the manager's office at least to, you know, they. So I don't know who's going to present it, but. Well, we, uh, you know, we advise directly to the council, so, mm -hmm. and the council directs management. So, um, I believe that it is um, something that is worthwhile to bring that up to the city council. Now, of course, they can choose to say, "No, thank you. We're not going to revisit." And that is their prerogative. prerogative. Um, but I would ask that now that that motion is passed, that that be put on the next um, re uh, city council agenda regular meeting. It won't be Monday. Uh, we're beyond the deadline. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And the next one that we can get notice out and the agendas and everything. Yeah. Are we done on this issue? I don't have any other comments on this issue. We've and closed it, yeah. Yeah, we closed the public hearing. And yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank so you guys much. for being here. Yeah. Yes. So helpful. Second Friday of every month at 10 to noon at the Utility Center. What's your name? I'm sorry. Katie. Dispatch? Yeah, I'm one of the ones that left to go. Yes. Oh, gotcha. Did you wait for me? Yeah. 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 I mean, I did my first call. So, we've still got a meeting going on here. If I could if I could just answer her question real quick. If I could just answer her question real quick. Okay. We'll speak later. We have another item on the agenda. If you, you, you want to postpone it, you know, we've already we've gone long. I am. Um, I think what Adam is requesting that we consider is is that we are at the 1144 mark, and the other item on the agenda is the oh rules of procedures. Yes. Um, from my standpoint, I have a very few little items to comment on. Um, so I would say with I, this 15 I, I have a number. I, you have a number? Because I totally disagree with this. So what, what, the, You said I didn't bring up enough stuff. No, no, no. no. So I talk, I'm going to do it. Okay. But are you talking about the person? Rule, rule, the rules personnel the board, I, I think it's totally out of line, a lot of this. Okay. Well, then, then, then I would make a motion to table it to the next meeting. No, I don't. We still got some time to talk. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, is there another meeting in there? No. Was the judge trying to kick us out? The judge? I mean, we have 15 minutes. It's open. And it's I open to the... Okay. No, uh, the, I think there there is, this room is used for uh, certain court proceedings uh, at a point in time, so... I know that Thank you, Mr. Room. Walker. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I think that's what she was checking. That's yeah. what we have 15 minutes. That's what the judge is checking on. This room. Okay. Okay. Well, then we can at least start on it. I will extend my motion. That they have to set up for it. Okay, so we need Let's to get start. out of here in like five minutes. They started new, right? So they need to yeah, set up. Set up that's what I'm okay. saying, right? So yeah, they still need to set up. Okay. okay. So probably five, five minutes or so. Yeah, we can cover five minutes of it and see where we get. There you go. Well. Do you want me to? I lost my page here. Let's um, see. That's the resolution. That's the resolution. Then. 
Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, you can I'll go ahead and on. start. Okay. Um, okay. You can take that if you want. Yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, with respect to the next item, if it's okay yes. with chairperson. Please, yeah. Uh, okay, let's start. And just, just to be clear, too, there's nothing that prevents you from sending any of your edits or notes prior to the meeting, and then we can potentially incorporate those in here and have the discussion then. We can regenerate a new draft prior to the meeting. So well, let, let me just go through and, and your edits, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And, so, and, and my stuff is. Yeah, and say, so. and say some of the ideas that I have on it. In the body of this, it talks about uh, regular meetings will be held on a, uh, a monthly basis. Up until about 13 months ago, we, we hadn't had a meeting about a one with everybody here in the quorum uh, for 15 months, or I'm sorry, three years. Now we're having them every month. And I know what an issue like what we're talking about today is something we ought to have special meetings to, to consider. Uh, I don't think in the body of this we need to codify 13 months, or I mean, of, 12 months in regard to uh, monthly meetings. Uh, so I would suggest that we maybe look at a quarterly meeting and then have special meetings like we're going to have on the 28th and employee appeals uh, as needed and as necessary. What section are you referring to? Yeah. I'm I know what you're speaking of, but I don't, mm -hmm. now I can't remember. Oh, okay, under meetings. It's, uh, I think it's on page two. Yeah, article two, number yeah, one. There we go, yeah. So, yeah. sir, okay. would you be saying so, like... So that's, a, yeah, it's article two. And uh, that, that was one of the things that I had a question on. Uh, meeting notice, the number two, uh, will be in keeping with applicable sunshine laws. Uh, I think maybe we could add something to that effect there. Um, Are you talking about getting agendas out? Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay. In terms of the agendas, uh, uh, I, I guess I didn't understand your sunshine point. Can you explain that? Well, I, I am just saying that basically our meetings uh, and and things like agendas and so forth mm -hmm. need to be in, in conformance. I have an objection that it says, well, we have to send certain things out within three days and within ten days. Uh, you know, it seems like we're being awfully bureaucratic for an advisory board or an advisory commission. And, uh, and I'm just saying, uh, you know, some of these things are, I, they were probably taken from another board. The PUAB? And, uh, the P, uh, PUAB. And they're a totally different type of board, just like this planning commission would be. Uh, so we need to do the things, not just what's in their particular uh, board. We need, we need to... Uh, yeah, and that uh, was a lot of the changes that I made at the last meeting were well, things that... Yeah, but I'm not seeing those in the copy here. Uh, if I could find I actually, it I actually went through and I would say 90... There was a section yeah, that said... This, it, is, this is the revised, pulp, uh, revised draft. Well, that's what you gave it here. Yes. Okay, all this right. This has every I haven't seen single that change today. we agreed on you last didn't. time. Yeah, the thing I had on my iPad was apparently the old... The old oh, do you material. want? I have a copy of the new one. No, I've got the new one. Oh, okay. Right here. Yeah, so, so a lot of those things are in there, which is what all I right, did to prepare right. for the meeting was to oh, look okay. at the red right. line copy okay. and this copy. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we're going to wrap up so we can I defer well, to I, the court. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, but there were just some things on here that seemed awfully bureaucratic that maybe we're overstepping. In other words, the personnel board will have the right to initiate personnel rules and policies before the city council gets involved. Uh, wording to that effect seemed to be awfully arrogant to me. I think and a lot of that is out of the charter. No. I mean, the charter, I mean, the charter, is, allows the charter is fairly specific with regard to the personnel board. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's why we need to write up something for this uh, charter commission. To, yes, which to I, yes, that would be a whole different thing. Yes. The personnel board. So if, if, I, if I may, real quick, um, I think the, the quarterly meeting, I don't, I don't, certainly don't think we have a, a big issue with that. 
you know, as we talked about before, what we were, what our plan is, once we have a few big items we need to get done, I think this is the last of those big items. Then we're gonna do kind of a comprehensive update to the manual, work with the labor coalition and, and, and that type of thing, and then bring it back to you all more as a holistic document. So meeting quarterly, um, that probably works for, for us, for what it's worth, um, because you know after this matter, my guess is we'll have less, you know, you know, it, we can let, allow some of those issues to build up for three months and then bring those to you in a, in a larger format. But t totally up to the board. Um, we're glad to, you know. Well, maybe we make it not, uh, I don't, a little more vague in the sense we just say that the personnel board will hold regularly scheduled meetings. Yeah, I'm fine with that. But it's not mm -hmm. monthly, it's not I'm, quarterly. I'm fine it's with that. What, what, what a lot of the language you see is they shall hold regular meetings no less than quarterly that way it's good at a minimum you're having a quarterly meeting if, yeah. if there's issues going on and you want to meet monthly or mm -hmm. weekly or whatever it is you can certainly well, do if we that. have an employee appeal yeah sure but anyway no yeah, less than quarterly means at least once a quarter you all are going to get together yeah, and so do that that's good language i like that i like that and uh, i can words and the other the other thing you know just an overall summary it seems like we're going to send a notice of all these things out to, I believe, the other language that I was reading on my iPad on the material sent to us uh, had to do with we're going to send out uh, all this information to all employees. Uh, and I thought, boy, this is getting carried away. Uh, uh, but that's yeah, required yeah. for a public. It? That's required for no, a public. Not. Hearing. What's required is to be. No. Posted in, in in conformance with Sunshine Law, and and posted in workplaces, and I would say going towards the employee represent, representative, the unions, uh, but to send these things out to a thousand city employees, and to and to send it out to four or five hundred retirees. You know, and I've worked in enough places that you get something regarding personnel rules to an employee. Truman Medical Center, for example, sends out this thing for retirees. And you get that and people say, well, what is this? You know, this is this is something going to affect me. And it really is nothing to affect the employee. But all. I think they should have the right to decide that. And the only way they'll know that is if they If it doesn't it. really apply to them, why send it out just as a bureaucratic? Because that's what's laid out. I mean, that's what's laid out, and I believe it's in the charter that yeah. requires we'll 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to be holding the court up. Yeah. We're going to be in contempt of court, and I don't have those fees. Yeah, we still got five minutes, so let's well, they, well, they, they have to represent us. Yeah. They have to be ready so you to do okay. yeah. formally. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I we will. are adjourned. Yeah. I, entertain, I will make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. Second. Second? Okay. All, All right. in favor, go. So, aye. We'll see everybody on the Thank you, guys. Yes.